Unexpected as it was, Hades, an indie game that I had never heard of and had no expectations for, was one of the games I enjoyed most thoroughly in 2020. Every attempt to beat the game or escape the underworld feels different as you can't rely on using the same techniques that you obtained through the previous run because of the random generation of the dungeon. The story nicely intertwines with the gameplay, but never interrupts the gameplay for very long. The character designs are exceptional, the controls are smooth, the frame rate is a consistent 60 FPS even on Nintendo Switch, as far as I can tell with how fast this game moves. The music is killer, Hades is fast and fun, and I can't recommend it enough, it's also priced quite reasonably. I've summed all of this up in a previous video that didn't contain story spoilers, however now I'm going to be digging deeper, so be aware you are now crossing the border into spoiler territory. I'll talk about the story and the characters, as well as a few strategies I've picked up along the way. I'll take you as far as the Fields of Elysium, but the House of Sticks will be saved for a follow-up video. In the gameplay loop, death will result in a return to the House of Hades, the game's safe zone. It is in these halls that most of the story and character development take place. There are a few key story points that are revealed when resting in your bed as well. The main plot is that our protagonist, Zagreus, has discovered that his mother is not Nyx, the Night Mother who raised him, but actually Persephone, who has left the underworld. In Greek mythology, the goddess Persephone, the daughter of Demeter and Zeus, is abducted by Hades, who forces her into marriage. Zeus sends Hermes to rescue Persephone from the underworld, but since she has tasted the forbidden fruit, the pomegranate, she must spend one third of the year in the underworld with Hades. This myth is meant to explain the change of the seasons, and Persephone is associated with both fertility and death. The style of the gameplay, the loop of death and rebirth, is well reflected by its Greek myth sources. Zagreus himself is a minor figure out of Greek myth. There's not much information about him, but he is either a son of Hades, another form of Hades himself, or he is a form of Dionysus, Dionysus in his first form, before he is ripped into pieces and then reborn when his father Hades recovers his heart. Again, this is all reflected in the gameplay, where you are torn to pieces and reborn frequently on each run through the dungeon. Dionysus is a child of Zeus and Persephone, while Zagreus is a child of Hades and Persephone. Zagreus and Dionysus are half-brothers. Zeus and Hades are also brothers. Greek mythology isn't confusing or weird at all, is it? On a side note, the humor in this game is really on point. So many video games try to be humorous and fail. They come across like they're trying too hard, or the humor is just really immature and cringy. The humor in Hades is more dry and understated. I like it. Zagreus first travels through the realm of Tartarus, which is the underworld of the underworld. Like in the underworld, Tartarus is a prison where criminals and monsters end up. At first, Megara, one of the three Furies and a potential love interest, is the gatekeeper who stands in Zag's way. On future attempts, she is replaced by her sisters, Alecto and Tisiphone. Tisiphone has a pretty one-track mind. In Greek myth, the Furies are portrayed as crones, and they exist to judge crimes and dole out punishment. Tisiphone punishes murder, Alecto punishes moral crimes, and Megara punishes infidelity and theft. Trading in and out these three characters for the first floor's boss fight, the one that will occur most, adds good variety and it pays tribute to its mythological backgrounds well. These fights all differ slightly. For example, in the Electo fight, there are more traps in the room than when you fight her sisters. During the Tisiphone fight, the room will fade to black and become smaller and smaller, though there are no pillars or traps. The Furies, like all of the game's bosses, become invulnerable during moments in the fight so the player needs to pay attention to this and go on the defensive. After completing a floor, there's a safe zone where the player can restore health, trade out keepsakes, and buy or sell abilities. The second floor Asphodel ramps up the difficulty a bit by adding hot lava that must be dashed over. In Greek mythology, Asphodel was not a searing hot hellscape, 
but calm meadows where ordinary people ended up after death. Great warriors would land in the beautiful fields of Elysium, which is the game's third floor. There are contradictory portrayals of Asphodel in myth. The name is most associated with a flower, though in the game it's neither a lush floral paradise nor a barren land of the dead. This depiction of Asphodel allows for a more distinct art design between the areas. It's here Zag will encounter either a mini boss fight against the Mega Gorgon and the Skull Crusher, or a survival round on the Barge of the Dead. I just think of it as the Danger Boat. The Mega Gorgon fight never caused me too much trouble. Just keep an eye on the telegraphed area attack where the giant stone head comes crashing down. The boss in Asphodel, the Bone Hydra fight, was a tough challenge the first time when I barely made it through. Yes, I did it! Ha! Oh my god, the Hydra is vanquished. That's what you get. <laughs> that is what you get. But on subsequent attempts, it became easier, and eventually this one is a walk in the park. At certain stages of the life bar, the Hydra will become immune, and Zag must jump all over the level, killing off smaller Hydras in order to damage the main one again. Large area attacks will be occurring, and it's easy to lose health here. For beginners, I advise acquiring one of Athena's defensive abilities as soon as possible. If you give Athena a gift early on, you can equip her Owl Pendant Keepsake, which will guarantee a boon from Athena soon after entering the maze. The Divine Dash, where reflective shields surround your character when you dash, is a must for beginners. It's not a bad idea to have your attack or special or both deflect as well, especially early on. As for other boons, it might come down to playstyle preference. Aphrodite, Goddess of Love and Beauty, specializes in charming enemies to fight alongside you or weakening their attacks. Dionysus, God of Wine and Madness, causes your attacks to inflict Hangover, where the enemy continues to take damage after being hit. Artemis, Goddess of the Hunt, increases critical hits and improves the cast, your projectile attack. Ares improves your attack damage and allows attacks to inflict Doom for a short burst of damage. Pro tip. Ares Blade Rift is good with the Artemis duo, but without it, the Blade Rift attack can be easy for enemies to dodge and might be a waste of a boon. You don't unlock the duo attacks until much later, but every now and then when you go get a boon, another god whose boons you have will show up and you are offered a duo boon. Hermes, the messenger of the gods, can boost movement, evasion, and attack speed. Poseidon, the god of the sea, gives a knockback ability to your attacks, and better rewards for clearing rooms. Zeus's abilities add lightning to your attacks that can be chained. Each god has a call ability where they can be summoned to help fight. The boons range from common to rare to epic to heroic, and then legendary. The heroic boons can only be obtained through exchanging epic boons, through cultivation from Demeter's rare crop boon, or through finding Eurydice in Asphodel. All of the gods' boons vary in usefulness depending on your weapon choice and playstyle. I recommend getting boons from Athena and Hermes to get more defense and speed. Dionysus' Hangover is a good one to add damage. The Festive Fog cast that you get from Dionysus is really useful. It's kind of like lobbing a hangover grenade at your enemies. Artemis's boons rely more on the random number generation of critical hits, so I usually don't go after her. Poseidon has a surprisingly good boon list, though some of the boons that give better room rewards become obsolete later on. Poseidon's call allows you to surf all around the room on a wave, and if you can circle an enemy tightly enough, you can really rack up some damage. Later into the game, Demeter is unlocked, and her boons cause chill, which slows down enemies or even shatters them. Chaos, the father of Nyx, the Night Mother, also has boons that can be acquired, though they work a little differently. First of all, the player has to sacrifice some health to visit him. His boons will put a curse on you for a set number of rooms, and after that, the curse will change to a blessing for the rest of the run. Using Chaos relies on knowing how many rooms are left until the boss encounter. The bosses will always appear on chambers 14, 24, and 36, with 13, 23, and 35 being safe rooms. The safe rooms do not count as encounters for curses or upgrades in general. The central joy of playing this game 
is learning all of these mechanics and building your character over and over again with different combinations of boons and upgrades. Currently, an Athena, Hermes, Dionysus, and Poseidon build seems to work well for me. I stay away from Ares, Artemis, and Aphrodite. I always seem to be picking other gods over Aphrodite. I've pissed off Aphrodite quite a few times. You dare to play with my heart, little godling? I'll just take yours and shatter it to pieces then, I think. Eventually, the musician Orpheus shows up in the House of Hades, and his estranged lover Eurydice is found in Asphodel, where she's singing on an endless loop. I suspect that eventually these two can be reunited, but I haven't been able to play Cupid and make that happen yet. There seem to be some resentments between them still. Like Sisyphus, Eurydice offers a choice for an upgrade. Ambrosia Delight will randomly upgrade two boons to the next rarity. Palm Porridge randomly upgrades four boons by one level, so it's like getting four palms of power. And Refreshing Nectar causes the next three boons you find to have upgraded rarity. This decision will always be made on whether you want to upgrade the boons you already have, or go for the possibility of better boons in the future, and it's always a tough choice. The third area, Elysium, is a serene and ethereal area, though it's filled with traps that shoot arrows and statues that stab you in the face, so maybe not that serene. The Bright Sword, Great Shield, Long Spear, and Strongbow enemies will all turn into ghosts and can revive themselves if you don't take them out fast enough a second time. There are chariot enemies that must be attacked from behind. There are also these little chariot enemies that suicide bomb you. It's best to stay away from them. Patroclus is sometimes found wasting away in Elysium. He's behind the same kind of door that would lead you to Sisyphus or Eurydice. He has this real woe is me vibe going on for someone in Elysium, the paradise of the underworld. Patroclus was a major character in the Iliad where he was Achilles' best friend and possible lover depending on who you ask. Patroclus can also be your friend with benefits, and those benefits are a choice of either replenishing all death defiance, increased health restoration, or 60% attack for 10 encounters. The mid-boss fight in Elysium will either be with the Butterfly Ball or Asterius the Minotaur. In the Butterfly Ball fight, Ghost will be spawning all over the room and it's good to take them out as you also get some hits in on the mini-boss. Beating the Minotaur will cause his life bar to be lower when you fight him again along with the hero Theseus as the main boss fight for this floor. The Minotaur and Theseus boss fight still gives me trouble. I often waste Death Defiance on this fight. Gaining the Death Defiance ability is basically like having more lives. You can get up to three, and they can be replenished sometimes at the Purple Shop Wells by some of Athena's boons, or by Patroclus if you run into him. During the boss fight, Theseus will summon help from one of the gods when his life bar gets low, so go after Asterius first. Try to attack him from behind, and keep out of the range of his giant axe. He's slow moving enough where it's not too hard to dodge. Don't forget to use a combination of all your upgrades, casts, and calls, because you'll need them to pummel these guys into submission. Theseus uses a shield, but also has a projectile attack that can hit from across the room, so keep an eye on what he's doing while you take out the Minotaur. Once it's just you and Theseus, use the same backstabbing strategy because he will outright block many of your attacks from the front. Like all of the boss fights, this one gets easier with repetition. There are some relationships that can be established with three of the NPCs in the game, Thanatos, Dusa, and Megara. Each one of these represents a different concept of love to the ancient Greeks. Megara represents eros, desire, and sexual passion. Dusa, who is a gorgon head, and the maid for the House of Hades. Maid, Dusa, get it, Medusa, represents philia, brotherly love, the love between friends. She's the one I've gotten furthest along with, though our date was a little awkward and didn't last very long. Well, since I don't exactly fit the mold of your traditional Gorgon, I mean, I have no body, for example. I had trouble finding work. Uh, that is until Lord Hades took me in, and then I met you, and well, I just love this job. Oh, I can definitely relate to at least some of that. 
Thanatos is the brother of Hypnos, Sleep Incarnate, and Thanatos is the personification of death. Every now and then Thanatos will show up and the two of you will clear a room together. If you take out more enemies than him, you get a reward. His area attacks are telegraphed, so if you see one forming, make sure to quickly take out all the enemies in that area. Thanatos represents agape, the highest form of love, unconditional, the love between God and man. Thanatos is not around as much to give gifts to, so I'm still working on that romance. I do plan on romancing all three. In real life, this would make you an asshole, but in a video game, you can have your cake and eat it too.